The Honorable Terence Dial Singh. Oops. The Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Trinidad and Tobago. Professor Brian Copeland, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, St. Augustine Campus, University of the West Indies. Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, the Kefil Campus, the UWI. Professor Prakash Pasad, President, University of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Colwick Wilson, President, University of the Southern Caribbean. Mr. Ronald Soifat, CEO, Eastern Regional Health Authority. Mr. Davlin Thomas, CEO, North Central Regional Health Authority. Mr. Brian Amor, CEO of the Southwest Regional Health Authority. Mr. Wesley Orr, CEO of the Tobago Regional Health Authority. Professor Terence Mongol, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the UWI. Dr. Roshan Parasram, Chief Medical Officer, Ministry of Health. Professor David R. Williams, Chair, Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. T.H. Chan, School of Public Health, Harvard University. The conference sponsors, the British Medical Journal and the Medical Marketing Company Limited. Members of the Inter-Institution Planning Committee and the Implementation Team. Distinguished guests, conference delegates, members of the media. My name is Professor Donald Simeon, the Director of the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development, and it gives me a pleasure to welcome you to Trinidad and Tobago's second annual 
Health Research Conference. The theme this year is Building Resilience Through Research in a Pandemic. Like last year, the conference is being hosted virtually, with only the moderators being live in a conference studio here at the Kreben Center for System Research and Development at the UWI Center, Augustine. As the theme suggests, the conference program includes several research reports that address the COVID-19, including issues such as vaccine uptake and hesitancy, its impact on population's mental health and quality of life, as well as the challenges faced in adapting to the so-called new normal. Importantly, COVID-19 was not the only health concern that the researchers addressed. The program is replete with over 70 papers on other infectious diseases, including NCDs, pharmacy, oral health, clinical investigations, and lab, and lab studies. I am pleased to report that the high standard and variety of research that was showcased in 2020 was matched, if not exceeded, this year. To deliver opening remarks, I invite Dr. Terence Simongal, Professor of Medicine and Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the UWI St. Augustine. Professor Simongal's professional career has focused on teaching and research and is recognized internationally as one of the leading researchers in the field of respiratory disease, in particular, in, in particular chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Welcome, Professor Simongal. Good morning, Donald, and a very good morning to our participants and the viewing audience, and a special good morning to our guest speakers. I will begin perhaps by saying uh, all protocols observed that has uh, given a good overview and welcome to, to everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Simeon, as head of the Center for Health Systems Research and Development, for uh, uh, coordinating this. But importantly, I would like to recognize the contributions of our fellow universities who are all involved here. This is our second National Health Research Conference. And I, I, I must uh, I must point out to all of us that the theme of building resilience during a pandemic is very important to us here in Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, in most countries, of course, uh, COVID has been a challenge, but here it has been a challenge in its own unique way. A few weeks ago, we had a conference on health and the pandemic, and this conference will now give a completely Trinidadian perspective, I hope, when it comes to the research. And of course, we'll have our guest speakers to give it a more international flavor. Uh, the Faculty of Medical Sciences has been working very hard to maintain our momentum during this pandemic. We, we were set back at earlier this year, but we are trying, as all other institutions in this country, to spin out of it as it were. And I'm pleased to see that there are so many research projects that are now coming online and uh, that I hope the authors will go forward to publishing. Uh, a major challenge that has now emerged is vaccine uptake. We are seeing a surge right now. This conference is going on. Of a surge in cases in COVID-19. Uh, our hospitals are filling up, so are our intensive care units. And by far, as the Ministry of Health announced last week, by far the majority of our cases are in the unvaccinated. It is therefore becoming in this country a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Not, not surprisingly, therefore, the important section of this conference devoted to vaccine update. And that, for me, is going to be the highlight of the conference. This is where we are going to help people if we can come up with the reasons for this, and then if we can translate this into practice. And we are happy to work with the other universities. In fact, on behalf of the principal, I want to say 
uh, how pleased we are to, to, be, to participate in a conference of this caliber with our colleagues from other universities in Trinidad and Tobago. And we, we want to say that we are ready to work with you to meet these challenges that are facing the country. With that in mind, I just want to put a plug for the NCDs. Very happy to see there's a section of the uh, program on the non-communicable diseases. We must not forget these with all the funding going into health COVID and rightly there it should be. We must still find a way to meet posters by the non-communicable disease pandemic facing us here and in the wider Caribbean. And in fact, I want to call our attention to what may well be a new stream of intake into the NCD epidemic that is facing us because the post-COVID syndromes uh, may well wind up some of the non-communicable diseases or special types non-communicable diseases that will be facing Trinidad and Tobago very soon. Again, I want to thank the organizers for, for this meeting and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and I hope that you do enjoy this uh, very important research conference. Thank you very much, Professor Simangal. Next to bring remarks at the opening ceremony is Dr. Colwick Wilson, President of the University of the Southern Caribbean. A sociologist by training, Dr. Wilson is described as a visionary, innovative, and collaborative leader with an extremely engaging personality. Good morning, Dr. Wilson. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Simon. It's a privilege and pleasure uh, to be associated with you and this conference. So all protocols observe. I am grateful for the privilege and the honor uh, to uh, present these remarks at this time. I present these remarks, as you know, on behalf of the University of the Southern Caribbean at this, the second edition of the National Health Research Conference. I extend exuberant congratulations uh, to the planning committees and our fellow collaborating institutions on the successful launch of the National Health Research Conference 2021. As a fellow researcher, this united effort speaks to the recognition of the importance of research in the Caribbean context, particularly as we strive toward national development and sustainability in the region. At the University of the Southern Caribbean, we have firmly placed a priority on research and welcome continued collaboration as we collectively develop a robust research agenda that is contextualized within the experiences of the Caribbean individual and the society. As we look to the future, USC joins with UE, UTT, and the regional health authorities here in Trinidad and Tobago in supporting the need to foster original research in the Caribbean that can be translated and implemented towards nation building and the health and well-being of our Caribbean community. Currently, USC is on a path to increase our involvement in research that can be translated to transform the lives of people in the Caribbean region and beyond. We are excited and continue and, con and committed to be a part of the National Health Research Conference and seek to continue to play an active role in this association as we move into the future. This year's theme, Building Resilience Through Research in a Pandemic, is especially relevant as this pandemic has specifically impacted the Caribbean region, not withstanding its impact on our economy and the toll it has taken on individuals and families. The loss of lives, 
restriction of movement, the isolation that we have experienced all combine to provide the catalyst for increased mental health challenges within this population. Yet, we remain resilient and focus as we seek to thrive despite this pandemic. Learning while in the midst of a pandemic through research is not only beneficial to our present time, but has significant meaning for the future as we continue to grow as a community through conferences like this one. It is here that I express my gratitude for the USC team of faculty researchers and our international guest speaker, a USC alumnus, Professor David Williams, for their involvement and contribution to the National Health Research Conference 2021. As thought leaders, you have represented us well through your collective and individual contributions to local, regional, and international academia and research. On behalf of the students, administration, faculty, and staff of the University of the Southern Caribbean, I say congratulations and welcome to this most important research conference, the National Health Research Conference 2021. Congratulations. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, for those reassuring words. Um, we'll be taking a very short break and we'll be back with you within the next minute or two.
Good morning and welcome back. Next on the program to bring remarks is Professor Prakash Pasad, President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Pasad is Professor of Mecha Mechatronics, a Fellow of the Association of Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, and a member of the Institution of Engineers, Engineering and Technology. Welcome, Professor Pasad. Thank you, Professor Simeon. It's my pleasure to be here at the, at the outset. Let me apologize for some technical difficulties I was facing. So my sincere apologies to all. The Honorable Terence D. L. Singh, Minister of Health, Professor Donald T. Simeon, Director, Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development, Professor Terence Simangal, Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, the University of the West Indies, Dr. Colbick Wilson, President, University of the Southern Caribbean, representatives from the regional health authorities, partners and sponsors, June audience, good morning. It is my distinct pleasure to deliver remarks at the opening ceremony of the 2021 National Health Research Conference. This event is set to facilitate open dialogue among key representatives in healthcare about its provisions during a pandemic the perception of the COVID-19 vaccine in our local landscape and how the sector intends to move forward in the face of the global health crisis. Discussions are intended to address research being carried out in the associated areas of public health, which will impact on the well-being of all citizens. These trends of research endeavor to sustain our society's health-related quality of life while sharing knowledge on its applicability and impact. Over the next two days, insights on the current status of a wide range of issues surrounding healthcare will be ventilated. The conference thus will provide a dynamic platform for national and regional stakeholders and international partners to exchange information and experiences on the development of a successful health economy. There has been and continues to be a clear and urgent need to address public opinion on vaccinations for the COVID-19 virus. To this end, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, for the last 18 months, engaged in public webinars focused on vaccine education and the misconceptions surrounding the development and the efficacy of these vaccines. The panelists in these webinars included experts from the health sector, the legal fraternity, and the education sector. It is worthwhile mentioning that UTT also contributed to the vaccination drive by allocating one of its campuses as a mass vaccination center and another as a step-down facility. UTT was established in 2004 with a focus on national development. Thus, in 2007, the university introduced a master's in health administration, now called the Master's in Health Administration Health Systems, designed to enhance the management and leadership capabilities of middle and senior level managers in the health sector, both public and private. The graduates of this program are educated and trained to address critical issues and to achieve more successful outcomes within the national health system. In pursuit of continuous improvement, the program has been adjusted recently for a more effective alignment with the national development goals as outlined in the government of Trinidad and Tobago's Vision 2030 National Development Strategy 2016 to 2030. At this point, I should also mention a bit of the research that UTD has been engaged in. The university in conjunction with health sector personnel developed the use of medical imagery for developing real-world 3D pro, um, prototyping models to assist in the planning of surgeries. Its research in developing a drug for the treatment of diabetes is in an advanced stage. In fact, a US patent was recently granted to the university for this drug and clinical trials are underway in India with a partner institution. Preliminary data indicates that to date, the outcomes of these trials are successful. Also, several projects funded by PAHO WHO on the digitalization of personal health services and data have been successfully completed. 
I'm also pleased to announce or to state that UTT is going to be a part of the India-UN Development Partnership Fund coordinated by PAHO, WHO on the implementation of health service robots in the health sector in this ongoing battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. This forms a part of the project entitled Bringing High and Low Technology to COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Interestingly, the project's acronym is HALT. It may sound inauspicious, and my own preference might be if you if we have a, a name like HILT, the handle for the drive to digitalize and bring an end to COVID-19. Globally, there's a mainstream acceptance that institutions of higher learning must play a critical role in the advancement and transformation of society by working closely with other academic institutions, government and industry. The much hyped triple helix model. In the local context, I think it is important that universities play a more active role in the formulation of policy and decision making at the national level as future leaders of the country and the region and captains of industry and commerce will emerge from these institutions. UTT's upcoming research symposium theme, Relevant Research for Sustainable Development, which is now in the third year, is in alignment with the aforementioned goals. It does give me great pleasure to indicate that UTT is very happy to be a part of this present initiative, which is similarly aligned and would allow for the fostering of an environment for the realization and implementation of local initiatives, policies, and regulations. I thus extend my most sincere compliments to the organizers and multi-sectoral partners of this timely and important national event. I am certain that the thought-provoking discussions engaged upon will be enlightened to all attendees and stakeholders and will impact positively on the efforts to build resilient health systems that will withstand the challenges posed by this pandemic and any future ones. Thank you. Professor Passard, for those, for those um, very reassuring words about the work being done at the UTT. Of course, we all have those challenges in terms of technical difficulties in connecting to meetings and conferences as part of the landscape or the, you know, during the, the, pan, the pandemic, you know, and of course, we, we look forward to, to, um, to technology being addressed. So on that note, I would like to now introduce our international guest speaker, Professor David Williams. Dr. Williams is a Florence and Laura Norman, Professor of Public Health and Chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Harvard University. He's an internationally recognized authority on social influences on health and has been invited to deliver the keynote presentations at many scientific conferences in Europe, in Africa, Australia, the Middle East, the Caribbean, South America, and across the USA. The author of more than 500 scientific papers, his research has enhanced our understanding of the ways in which race, socioeconomic status, stress, racism, health behavior and religious involvement can, can affect physical and mental health. The everyday discrimination scale that he has developed is the most widely used measure of discrimination in health research studies. Today, his presentation is entitled Resilience for Mental Health in the Age of COVID. Professor Williams, I welcome you to the Trinidad and Tobago National Health Research Conference. Thank you so very much. Um, all uh, courtesies and acknowledgements that have already been specified, I acknowledge them and it's an honor and privilege to join you today. I am going to share my screen uh, so that <clears throat> you can see uh, my presentation. Um, Um, one second, I'm... Um... 
I, I get a message that screen sharing is not allowed. Uh, can some technical person help me? It's okay. We will. Okay, we will be addressing that now. Let's hold on for one minute, please. Okay. Okay, while we work with Professor Williams to sort out the screen sharing challenge that he's facing, I would like to introduce Professor Brian Copeland, co Vice Chancellor and Campus Principal of the UWI St. Augustine, to bring remarks. PVC Copeland is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and importantly, he was the first recipient of the Order of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago the nation's highest award. Professor Copeland, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Donald. Uh, to the Honorable Terence de Alsing, Minister of Health, our feature speaker, Professor David R. Williams, Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, Dr. Colwick Wilson, President of the University of Southern Caribbean, Professor Prakash Prasad, President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Professor Terence Simangal, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, uh, Professor Donald Simeon, Director of the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development, and other UE colleagues, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We at the University of the West Indies have, from our very inception in 1948, made a commitment to serve in the advancement of the Caribbean community and sustain its development. We know that no university can operate in a silo. Indeed, as our strategic plan for 2017-2022 has noted, and I'm quoting here, fine universities are not established and funded to serve themselves, unquote. Rather, they must engage the challenges facing their host communities. It's stressed that the UE must necessarily align with partnerships relevant to national and regional needs, stating in part, and I quote again, academic and entrepreneurial empowerment through teaching and learning and rekindling the agenda of applied research and professional training are critical to building the region's resilience and promoting the practice of relentlessly pursuing sustainable development. For that reason and more, the UWI is pleased to be a partner institution in the staging of this two-day meeting, and indeed, to have actively served on the Inter-Institutional Planning Committee leading up to this National Health Research Conference. Now, in August 2020, a blog authored by one Tamara Kamis for the Borgen Project, a nonprofit that addresses poverty and hunger worldwide, noted that the people of Trinidad and Tobago have access not only to universal health, universal health coverage through our national insurance system, but to a low cost network of hospitals and public clinics. This is certainly a good thing. I want to be envied elsewhere. Further, the blog noted that our well-developed infrastructure limits the prevalence of infectious illness and facilitates effective medical care. Now, I'm sure you would agree that Trinidad and Tobago's management of COVID-19 since March of last year and the quick introduction of a parallel health system can attest to this fact. However, there is a downside. For several years, public and private sector health practitioners have been sounding the alarm about Trinidad and Tobago's exceedingly high incidence of chronic disease, including cardiovascular illnesses, uh, diabetes, hypertension, 
cancer, and cerebral uh, vascular disease, accounting for more than 60% of the deaths nationally. Combine that with a pandemic and vaccine hesitancy, and we have a recipe for social and economic disaster. Now at the UE, we are quite aware of our role as a stakeholder in the challenge of optimally preparing citizens to survive and thrive in the best and worst times. This unspoken mandate can only be ultimately achieved if in Italia, citizens are in the best possible physical and mental health through every single stage of their God-given lifespan. Despite the tremendous advances in medicine and given the inordinately complex nature of human biology and physiology, we still fall short, unfortunately, of the mastery of the knowledge required to achieve this goal. It is for this reason that we must be unrelenting in the conduct of medical research and why conferences such as this are so important. Over the next two days, various experts will present research and data relating to public health, environmental health, communicable, communicable and non-communicable diseases, nutrition, and of course, on the economic, social, and behavioral issues relating to the health of our nation. So ladies and gentlemen, this is where all of you participating in this two-day think tank come in. You are the people on the ground, or you may be planning to work on the ground like all medical sciences students here. You are the ones who are charged with the responsibility for the health of our citizens. I urge you to tap into your collective knowledge, share the statistics, the data, your knowledge and experience, and identify strategies for leveraging the, this discourse to effect lasting positive change to the health and well-being on an often recalcitrant population. And so on behalf of the St. Augustine campus of the University of Western Leeds, I wish all of you a productive and collaborative two days of learning and sharing. I thank you. Have a good morning. Thank you very much, Professor Copeland, for those remarks on behalf of the UWI St. Augustine campus. Um, I think that we should be ready to get back to Professor Williams. I think we did sort out the technical challenges that we face with the sharing of his screen. So, Professor Williams, can you hear? Yes, I can hear you very well, and I'm assuming you can hit, see my screen. Yeah, I am sharing my screen now. Okay. So, Yes, yes, you can see it, yes. Okay, yes. this is wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad we have worked through the technical difficulties. Um, and this is an example of the need for resilience so we don't panic uh, when we face <laughs> so true. Um, uh, challenges, uh, fits with the talk. I think we are living in an age of high and ever increasing levels of stressful life experiences um, that have adverse impacts on mental health. Research indicates that populations around the world are dealing with major life events like the death of loved ones or high rates of unemployment or financial difficulties like not being able to pay bills at the end of the month or relationship stressors. Uh, many people in your circle making too many demands on you or neighborhood stressful experiences like robbery and having your home broken into. There's also unprecedented levels of stress linked to the use of social media. Research indicates that smartphones and being on Facebook or Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, etc., are having a big toll, especially on young people's mental health. Heavy use of smartphones and social media negatively affects academic performance, sense of self, and mental health. Research finds as hours per day increase on smartphones, happiness, life satisfaction, and self-esteem fall. Increased screen time is also linked to less sleep and increasing thoughts of suicide in school-age kids and teenagers. Globally, uh, there's a study that was just reported this year that has looked at 37 countries and has interviewed young people there between 2000 and 2018. And in 36 of the 37 countries, Loneliness among 15 and 16 year olds have increased from 2000 to 2018. In fact, in 2018, twice as many 
adolescents are lonely as in 2000. What, when did this start, this trend start? It started in 2012, the start of marked increases in loneliness. What is notable about 2012 is that's the year when there was steep increases in smartphone and internet use globally. The increase in loneliness is also larger for girls than for boys. So what I'm saying is we are finding that the psychological well-being of teens around the world began to decline with the rise of heavy smartphone and internet use. And then there is the pandemic. And the pandemic has brought an added burden, an added layer of stressful life experiences. When we think of the pandemic, we have to recognize that globally, 5.1 million people have died as of yesterday. In the US, that's 763,000. Brazil, 611,000. India, 464,000. Mexico, 291. Russia, 252,000. The UK, 143. Other countries in our region, Colombia, 128,000. Argentina, 116,000. And most experts believe that these numbers have underestimated the full impact of the pandemic. And COVID-19 is not only causing the loss of life, it has aggravated the vulnerability to mental health. Because of COVID-19, there are increased experiences of the death of a loved ones and grief and loss and witnessing the suffering of loved ones and anxiety and fear of getting infected by the disease. A decrease in social support from co-workers, family and friends because we are having less social interaction. And then there is the fear of the virus and uncertainty of how best to, to navigate issues of testing of whether you should get the vaccine or not, and of treatment. As a result, socially and economically vulnerable populations are likely to experience more trauma, leading to more emotional and physical symptoms, such as anxiety, helplessness, nausea, and headache, causing them to seek more relief from stress. COVID-19 is also a major source of economic stress on the health of the most vulnerable. I'm gonna draw on US data to illustrate this. This is national data for the United States. The percent of individuals by race whose family has lost, a family member has lost a, work, a job or income during the pandemic. Almost 40% of whites, 51% of blacks, 59% of Hispanics. And if we look at those who are having trouble paying basic living expenses, and that has happened within the last three months. One third of whites and half of all blacks and Hispanics are having economic crises. We also see this is patterned by income. This is US data, but we believe this is true everywhere, um, that low income uh, populations have a higher challenge of meeting basic living expenses. To illustrate just the mental health impact, I'm going to draw on a national study in the U.S., but I, I caution you that there are studies from other countries that are showing similar patterns. It interviewed over 5,000 adults, representative of the country. 41% reported at least one adverse mental or behavioral health problem because of the pandemic. 31% had symptoms of anxiety and depressive disorder. 26% reported trauma and stress-related disorder linked to the pandemic. 13% said they have increased the use of substances, alcohol, and drugs to cope with the stress related to COVID-19. And 11% said they had seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. And the consideration of suicide varies by race. 8% of whites, 15% of blacks, 19% of Hispanics. It also varies by other social circumstances. 26% of 18 to 24 year olds. This is national data for the United States. One in four 18 to 24 year olds said they have considered committing suicide in the prior month because of COVID. And the numbers are even higher for unpaid caregivers of adults. And it's 22% uh, for essential workers who are keeping the economy going. We have a mental health crisis. What do we do 
when faced with such a crisis. The good news is there are strategies to improve mental health. Health is available. It can make a difference. And, but we have to put it into action. And it's not a one-stop deal because there is no vaccine uh, for mental health problems. So what can we do to build resilience? First of all, establish and maintain a routine. A routine for eating meals at regular time, going to bed at regular time, scheduling a positive or fun activity that you could look forward to on a daily or weekly basis. Take breaks from the news. Yes, we need to keep informed, but hearing bad news constantly can be upsetting and can lead to even more stress. We need each other. Have a trusted adult to whom you can talk openly and, and safely. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Research is indicating that just being thankful, there are clinicians now asking all of their clients to make a list of three things each day that they can be thankful for. And that little exercise has been shown in studies to reduce fatigue, to increase mood, to improve mental health, and to lead to better sleep. And get regular exercise. Exercise reduces stress and the risk of emotional uh, exhaustion. Let me elaborate on exercise. Moderate intensity exercise reduces symptoms of depression. It also helps to regulate immune function. And in the face of a pandemic, anything we can do that will enhance uh, immune function uh, is a good thing for us to do. What else can we do to build resilience? Sleep. Yes, sleep is good for us. Studies reveal that persons who don't get enough sleep in the studies they have used, some studies have used uh, less than seven hours, less than six hours, less than five hours, is associated with a 31% increased risk of depression. But also, sleeping too long, more than nine hours, is associated with a 42% increased risk of depression. So being in that sweet spot of six to eight hours um, is, is good for your mental health. A good night's sleep is also linked to better immune function. So again, in a pandemic, we want to improve mental health, we want to improve uh, immune function, and uh, sleep is a good resource along those lines. When we sleep well, we wake up feeling refreshed and alert for our daily activities. Research suggests there is some variation in the need for sleep, but all of us need six to eight hours. If you get in more than nine, you get in too much, and, and it's linked to higher risk. Um, if that is for adults, adolescents can do with nine or more hours, and younger children, um, five years old and so on, can, can really benefit from 12 hours of sleep. What else can we do? Well, in building resilience, we doesn't have to be on your own. It is okay. It is not just okay. It is a good thing to reach out for help, to access services that would help to address your emotional, mental health, and substance use challenges. I want to share with you some findings from a study. I was a part of a team that conducted the largest study of black mental health in the United States that for the first time included a sample of blacks of Caribbean ancestry. What we found in this study it was a mental health study among persons who met criteria for major depression in the United States. So these are people who are not just having depressive symptoms, but they are clinically depressed. Only 57% of all US adults had received any kind of therapy in the prior year. That number fell to 45% for African Americans. But among Caribbean black immigrants and their children in the United States, that number was 24%. Only 24% of clinically depressed uh, Caribbean Blacks in the United States, West Indians in the United States, um, had received any kind of clinical help. Is there something deeply embedded in our culture? I don't know that, that leads to this pattern, but it, it suggests that we may distinctively have a challenge to raise awareness level that just as if you have a heart attack, a heart problem, you seek out the best cardiologist, the best heart specialist that you can get, 
if you have mental health problems, there is no sign of weakness to seek out help and to get the help that you need. What else do we need to do to build resilience? I would say utilize the spiritual resources that you have. The research is clear on this. Here is one of the first studies I did back published in 1991 on the role of religious attendance and mental health. We looked at a population in the city of New Haven, Connecticut. We followed them for two years. We, collect, we uh, assessed their mental health at the beginning and at the end. We assessed the stressful life experiences that they had in between. And what we found that persons who uh, experienced more stressful experiences had worsening mental health. However, frequently attending religious services reduce the negative effects of stress on their mental health. There's a recent national study to give you another example that documented the same pattern. It looked at African Americans in the US um, and looked at the negative effects of the stress of racial discrimination on their mental health. And the study found that three aspects of religious involvement, frequency of religious attendance, having a network of support in your local congregation or place of worship, and seeking religious guidance in your everyday life. Each of these aspects of religious involvement reduced the negative effects of the stress of racial discrimination on mental health. So utilizing spiritual resources can also improve mental health. What else? Uh, this should sound like good music to West Indians. Research documents that music, maximizing the potential of the solace of music can also be a resilience factor for mental health. Listening to relaxing music or music that one truly enjoys has been linked to reducing symptoms of anxiety, has also been linked to improving immune functioning. Um, biomarkers of stress like cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine decrease in response to relaxing music. So reductions in stress are linked to immune functioning. Again, music improves mental health and enhances immune functioning. What else can we do to build resilience? Learn to forgive yourself and others. Yes, there is scientific research on this. And the words of Anne Lamott should be taken to heart. She said, not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die but you drank the poison. Is there evidence for this? Here is a book published in 2015. I'm a co-editor with two other forgiveness researchers that documents unforgiveness towards others is associated with psychological distress. And forgiveness of an offender or an offense and a general disposition to forgive is associated with lower symptoms of depression, of anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, reduces anger and stress, and it leads to higher levels of well-being. One of the co-editors of the book, Professor Lauren Toussaint, have give you an example from one of his studies. He studied young adults, and he shows that learning to forgive is a stress reduction strategy. Higher levels of severe stress over their lifetimes predicted worse mental health and worse physical health. However, lower levels of forgiveness was linked to worse physical and mental health. But this is the kicker. Professor Tucson Fine, if people were forgiven both of themselves and others, forgiveness took the bad effects of stress on mental health and reduced it to virtually zero. That is, developing a forgiven response to major stresses buffers or dulls the negative effects of stress on mental health. If you are not forgiven, you feel the raw effects of stress in an unmitigated way. I want to talk, close my talk by paying special attention to youth. I talked about the impact that heavy use of social media and, and being on the internet can have on our youth. Um, I believe abuse of smartphones is probably not a good idea. This generation has not known the world without social media and digital interactions are norm. But parents and other adults and teachers and others need to work with teens to monitor and to limit 
their social media use and to help them set boundaries. It also helps if adults can set a good example of the use of social media. What do youth need from adults? They need a their life who they can talk to and who they can trust. They need sp safe spaces where we can hear from them. I didn't say safe spaces where we can talk to them because we are often ready to do that, but safe spaces where we can listen to them. The validation of their experience if they are sad, depressed, and stressed. Don't tell them to get over it. Don't tell them they shouldn't feel that way. Acknowledge and validate the experiences they have. Help them feel that they are not alone. Point them to resources to cope. They need to stay engaged. Have them engaged in service to others and social justice in making a difference in their community. I want to show you the power of engaging young people. There was a study done several years ago of native youth, that's indigenous youth in Canada. This group had one of the highest rates of youth suicide in the world. Researchers studied that community and found that half of the 196 First Nation communities had no youth suicides whatsoever in the prior five years. The group has very high rates, but some have none at all. The study identified five markers of challenging the government the Canadian government for titles to land, for right of self-governance, for control over services, and having a place in the community where cultural activities would be supported and the youth would learn about their past. The study found that each of those indicators of advocacy, protest, empowerment, and cultural affirmation was associated with a lower risk of youth suicide. There was a strong dose-response relationship between the number of markers and the prevalence of suicide. There's also evidence that we need holistic, comprehensive approaches. Research finds that if we take young people, zero to 18, get them out in the open, get them into green space, get them to enjoy the wonderful nature that, that we have in our islands, that improves their, their overall health and their cognitive well being. There are so many psychological factors like memory and attention restoration and the moderation of stress that is improved by getting out in green space. What else does research tell us? Yes, a positive association is found between fruit and vegetable intake and the mental health of young people. Green and yellow vegetables and fresh fruit were especially beneficial for the general mental health of adolescents. I leave you with these words. Out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls, the most massive characters are seared with scars. Yes, out of suffering, we can build resilience. Out of suffering, we can overcome our scars, but we have to take actions and engage in those activities that will promote resilience uh, for our mental health. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. Thank you. Oops, that made a noise. Thank you very much, Professor Williams, for that brilliant and thought-provoking presentation. We will speak again soon during our question and answer panel discussion. Delegates, please pose, please pose your questions in the Q&A tab to the right of your screen. The Q&A tab is the one with the question mark. At this time, we are pleased to have with, with, with us this morning, the Honorable Minister of Health of, of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, um, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh. Minister Dial Singh is a second Term Minister of Health and a valued member of the Cabinet of the Trinidad and Tobago's government. As Minister, he has placed as his priority the repositioning and rebranding of the, of the three highs to the three lows, namely high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol, to positively impact on the exploding epidemic of NCDs. In addition to reducing the burden on, of NCDs, he has focused on other national health priorities, such as reducing maternal mortality to below the Sustainable Development Goals, the, SD, the SDG 
2030 targets achieving the PAHO WHO 1990 goals for HIV by 2025, as well as to demonstrate the commitment to a centralized mental health service to a community-based approach to behavioral health management. The minister was also responsible for the conceptualization and execution of the parallel healthcare system, one of the key public health strategies implemented to mitigate the hospital care fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister Dial Singh, welcome back to the National Health Research Conference. Thank you, Professor Simeon. I hope I'm being heard. If you could just wave your hand. Yes, yes, so we are hearing you loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Donald Simeon, a uh, friend and colleague, Director of Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development, uh, UWE, St. Augustine. Professor Terence Mangal, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Directors of the Board of the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development, UB St. Augustine campus. Presenters, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, if they are present, a very pleasant good morning to you on this Thursday morning. It is indeed my pleasure to be invited once again to address you on your second National Health Research Conference 2021 on the theme, Building Resilience to Research in a Pandemic, how apt. To use a Robert Quinn phrase, I feel like I'm building the bridge as I'm walking on it. Or like the Wright brothers probably building a plane while flying it at the same time as we at the Ministry of Health are literally living the experience and learning the lessons of building a resilient health system in a pandemic. I will not be speaking to you as a subject matter expert, as I too am part of this learning cohort, just like you, contributing to the body of knowledge, the science, and the community of practice. What I propose to do in the time allotted is to share with you the following the Ministry of Health's pandemic experience in building a health system which is resilient. And by resilient, I mean a health system that can absorb a shock, deal with that shock, and bounce back to its original form. It's like a ball. You hit a ball against a wall in slow motion, you will see it being compressed. And then it goes back to its original shape update you as to where we are at this crossroad and alert the forum of the plans of the Ministry of Health to establish a national, national health research ethics policy to improve researchers' capacity con to conduct ethical health research through the strengthening of the national health research ethics systems. PAHO WHO has defined health research as a process designed to systematically gain valid knowledge by following scientific, and this is a key word, reproducible methods that are meant to be implemented in ways that improve the health of individuals or populations. And why do I focus on the word reproducible? There is a tendency now with COVID to ask the Minister of Health whenever he appears, well, country X is doing this, and country Y is doing that. And when we point out that these things have not been peer reviewed, they have not been reproducible, to the layman, it seems that we are being lax in not bringing cutting edge technology. But we in research have to be ethical in only bringing these things that are reproducible and peer reviewed. Research is essential to improve the health and well being of populations. As Trinidad and Tobago increases its capacity to conduct essential health research, it is imperative to ensure that research is conducted ethically so that the well being of those who participate in research, like yourselves, is adequately protected and that institutions involved in the conduct of research assume their responsibility of ensuring that such research is ethical. We at the Ministry of Health understand that research relies on scientific and academic innovation. 
by posing new ideas and suggesting alternative answers to medical and social questions. We aim to have evidence-based care and practice at the forefront of health delivery. Put simply, research needs to be an integral part of any healthcare environment, Young 2015. Notably, the Ministry of Health's response to COVID-19 was based on our understanding of using the latest research to transform our health sector with its minimal resources to respond to a pandemic that could have wiped out our entire population. Researchers such as yourselves commit to bringing the latest evidence research to the forefront. This was invaluable in our response to this global pandemic and building capacity that contributed to the health system resilience. Health system resilience has been a trending buzz phrase for the past few years that has gained traction and assumed new importance and relevance since the emergence of the COVID-19 global pandemic in 2020. This resilience phenomenon has affected all health systems in the developed and developing world, especially those of the small island developing states. You would recall over the past decades, the health system resilience theme has been associated with a number of international and localized infection, infectious disease outbreaks, ranging from H1N1 to SARS to Ebola to chikungunya to Zika, and now COVID-19. And we ask, what is next? With each outbreak, there was a repeated and sustained call to strengthen health systems and, of course, the clarion call for the implementation of the international health regulations. Fact is, health systems of the world have been subjected to repeated insults of various kinds that affect health systems resilience. These insults include infectious diseases mentioned above and not to mention NCDs. In addition, other insults, not only the NCDs, which I just spoke about, but other insults such as HIV AIDS, obesity, mental health, which Professor Williams just spoke about, climate change, financial downturns, and the annual cycle of all these disasters with such negative consequences the island states. I have no doubt that throughout your conference, all of these issues will be explored models and definitions of resilient health systems will be offered, discussed and agreed upon with defining characteristics identified and prioritized. Characteristics such as evidence-based, responsiveness, predictive, adaptiveness and agility, robustness, a level of horizontal and vertical integration, but more importantly, people and community centricity those are who we serve. So rather than go down that path, as I mentioned, I would offer the practitioner's perspective of the real challenges of managing a health system during a global pandemic. and speak to some of the strategies that we at the Ministry of Health and the wider government administration have taken to ensure that we have a resilient health system. The question I would like to pose and attempt to answer how do we manage the health system during these turbulent pandemic times so that we guarantee the provision of care while at the same time staying a true, staying true to the principles of universal access and in Trinidad it is universal free access, availability, quality and service to our clients? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and my friends, the short answer is we do it but we do it with great, great difficulty. The long answer is that we cannot do it alone and it cannot be done alone. Resilient health systems calls for a whole of government and whole of society approach. And in addition to all the characteristics identified earlier, building partnerships. These partnerships cross and traverse several domains, the public and private sectors, the regional and international, the academic and the NGO, the diplomatic and the engagement of the man in the street, or what the lawyers call when you go into year one law school, the man on the clap on bus, labor, unions, etc. 
partnerships with higher learning institutions like the University of the West Indies. And let me, at this point in time, heartily congratulate the University of the West Indies for being a staunch ally, not only in this pandemic, but prior. Any time I have called on the University of the West Indies to assist, to guide, to advise, you have been there. May I offer a virtual round of applause to the University of the West Indies. In the area of research, we have collaborated in research of variants of concern and variants of interest. Prior to the university being able to do genomic sequencing, any one of the Caribbean states had to go up to CDC Atlanta to have genomic se sequencing done. We are now doing it locally. And thanks to the University of the West Indies and Professor Christine Carrington in particular, we have collaborated in testing new clinical treatment regimes through randomized controlled trials, partnerships through training as with our doctors and nurses and specialist training, especially our ICU nurses, partnership in housing COVID-19 patients and in establishing quarantine facilities, partnerships with the private sector in testing, vaccination and support. We can't do it alone. Partnerships with colleague ministries and agencies, such as the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of National Security, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Ministry of Digital Transformation, the Ministry of Communication, and the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, all led by our Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Lowry. Partnerships with our CARICOM countries and colleagues with respect to sharing of information and vaccines as well as partnership with regional and international agencies such as the IDB, UNDP, PAHO, WHO, CAFA, and CARICOM. The second cornerstone is information and science and how we use this information and science to inform policy development. Specifically, I am here referring to a robust research and development function that will inform translational policy and decision making that is informed by good science. If nothing else, nothing else, my friends, the pandemic has taught us is the value of science in making decisions, managing human resources, and contributing to the sustainability of mental health. At this point in time, I want to say how wrapped I was in the uh, presentation by Professor David Williams, which preceded me talking about mental health. We took a decision years ago to decentralize mental health, but right now with this pandemic, he was speaking about the mental health of populations. I want to refer now to what we are doing. In part of our decentralization, we have come up with this concept where we have 30, 30 agencies, 30, 30, under one headed, fine care TT. You just go on to find care TT and you can find 30 agencies that you have access to hotlines 24 seven to assist you with any aspect of mental health. It is linked to the Children's Authority, the Red Cross, all the RHAs, Consortium of Disability Organizations, uh, TTPS Protection, um, UE Migration, I mean, it's, it's just a fantastic way of decentralizing mental health. The parallel healthcare system. By way of specifics, the Trinidad and Tobago experience in the area of health system resilience has been an interesting and instructive one. By now, you will all be familiar with this term, our parallel healthcare system. Many have ascribed meaning and the reason for this, but the truth is, the purpose of the parallel health system is to buffer, protect, isolate, and insulate the regular healthcare system from the contagion from being overrun, overwhelmed, and being cannibalized by a single disease that is COVID-19. Trinidad and Tobago doesn't understand how lucky we are that we instituted that. Our regular hospital system has been isolated 
and COVID-19 gets treated in a parallel system where the best possible care is there. We are indeed fortunate to have these new facilities which we can have used. This complementary care pathway for COVID-19 patients has been a single major national tool in the clinical therapeutic response to COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. The system com currently comprises, and I say currently because it is dynamic and fluid, demonstrating the adaptiveness and resilience and agility of the system. It currently comprises 17 facilities and institutions, 15 in Trinidad and two in Tobago, with an overall capacity of about 1,100 beds, spanning the whole spectrum of care. What are the challenges and risks? The reality is there are challenges and risks every day at every juncture of healthcare in this continuum of COVID-19. Specifically, detection and screening, especially now with new variants. And who knows what new variant is around the corner? Prevention and education. Main challenge now is vaccine hesitancy. Treatment and care care and support and rehabilitation from long COVID. What are the risks in this resilience modeling? The emergence of new variants that may be more virulent, suboptimal vaccination rates, social media, vaccine hesitancy, the change in vaccination protocols by way of now additional primary doses, and who knows, eventually boosters the issue of increasing number of breakthrough cases. And the third most important is the fodder it provides to the vaccine naysayers, hesitant and resistant in fueling the narrative. You see the vaccines don't work. Vaccines are not a magic bullet. They are not going to reverse your cancer and make sure you don't die, die of cancer or end stage renal disease. What the vaccine will do is significantly decrease your chances of contracting COVID. And if you do, decrease your chances from needing hospitalization and dying from COVID. Those are the three promises of vaccines. And they have worked spectacularly so far in that. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we doing to make sure that the other healthcare system, the explosion of NCDs, the explosion of mental health disease that Professor Williams spoke about. We have to make sure our health system continues to be resilient, continues to be resilient. And we have to make sure that resources are not always diverted from elective surgeries, our NCD clinics, to treat unvaccinated individuals, but that is where we are. These are the dilemmas, these are the choices that we make on a daily basis because we want our outpatient clinics to be back up to 100%. We want our elective surgeries to be back up to 100%. We want granny to get her free cataract surgery. So how long can we maintain this situation of continually diverting resources into the parallel healthcare system. What we would like to do, and I will say, is not for want of trying. We have hosted since the start of this pandemic, maybe over two to 300 media conferences, 600 clinical updates. We have brought the national population, our best and brightest minds, scientists, public health specialists, immunologists, specialist physicians, mental health experts, international epidemiologists, our frontline nurses and doctors to explain and inform the public and bring the science in a palatable form to the population and to account for our stewardship. We have to account. We have remained available, open and transparent. We have shared good news and we are the first to break bad news to the population. And we have answered all and every question posed by our responsible media. And let me thank again our media. We will continue to reach out and engage the population and provide the information and science so that persons can make an informed decision about being vaccinated. 
we have provided and continue to provide daily statistical reports on COVID-19 testing, prevalence, incidence, morbidity, and mortality from year 2021. The government, through the Gavi Alliance, direct vendor purchase and donation, has brought a total of 1.9 million vaccines to this country. And to date, we have administered 1.2 million. At the height of our vaccination program, we had over 305 contact points where persons could have accessed, it, accessed the vaccines. My friends, in closing, the COVID-19 global pandemic has tested and will continue to test the resilience and robustness of the Trinidad and Tobago health system, and I dare say health systems around the world. And some are currently buckling under a fourth wave. To date, we have done reasonably well. I dare say better than many developed countries with significantly more resources than us. As of close of financial year, September 30th, 2021, we have spent in direct medical costs on COVID about $518.4 million across four heads, consumables, equipment, HR, and infrastructure. In closing, again, I wish to applaud the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development for hosting this conference again. And thank you for your invitation to address you one again, once again. As I close, I have to now leave to go to cabinet, which starts in a few minutes. So I would not be, uh, be able to join you for your Q&A, but rest assured of my continued support, the government's continued support, and I wish you good day, goodbye, and a good meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Diel Singh, for another timely and informative address. We certainly appreciate your leadership and your continued fight against COVID and other health challenges in the country. I now invite Professor Williams to rejoin us for the Q&A session. Professor Williams? Yes, I am here and I'm happy to answer any questions that might have okay. emerged. Okay, so I actually have one, you know, to start, to start the ball rolling. You mentioned the importance of music, and of course, you said Caribbean people, you know, are known for music. Yes. Is there any special type of music that may have um, more or less um, benefits in, in terms of mental health? Uh, th that is a really good question. Um, what the studies have found uh, generically is, is music that an individual finds relaxing. Uh, it is the music um, uh, that seems to have the biggest impact. Now, um, what type of music an individual finds relaxing uh, may depend on that person's um, cultural background and, and what they are accustomed to and what they find relaxing. So there's some, uh, some studies find it's, it's certain types of music. Uh, some of the studies find classical music, for example, um, is, is very, um, ha has those uh, benefits. But other studies find that maybe what's most important is music that the person really enjoys. And, and it may not be be linked to the specific form of music. So I, I would say it, it, the evidence is not 100% clear because there's not been a ton of studies in the area, but the evidence clearly indicates is, is music that an individual experiences as relaxing, I would say, is, is what seems to be the, the most important form. Thank you. So listen, so listen to the music that you enjoy is what yes, you are saying. Yes, yes. yes, excellent. Good. Okay. It gives you a break from, from this. Yes, 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 of course. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Yes. Um, there is a, a question. Um, it relates to, well, what strategies can be implemented in Caribbean countries that can treat with the mental health issues that may arise from the lockdown restrictions? Um, th that is a really um, uh, good question. Um, I, I think there are a number of, of examples um, that that could be very helpful. 
um, even in what I would say um, low resource settings as 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 the Caribbean is. And I I am from the island of St. Lucia. I, I studied in Trinidad, so I, I understand the, the region that I'm talking about, um, although I've lived in the U.S. for the last 40 years or so. Um, the the point I would, would, would make is there's, there's a lot of evidence, e even the, the World Health Organization has um, some mental health resources uh, on their website of, of what can be done um, in low resource settings. Um, two things I would say that are important. One is to provide resources to individuals who are suffering with mental health problems, you do not necessarily need to have a formally trained um, mental health therapist. Don't get me wrong. Uh, they, they bring special skills to the table. We want to use them and maximize the, 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 the expertise that they bring, and that's important. But it is also important to acknowledge that you can have um, in a local community, um, in a local uh, church, in a, in a local religious organization, you can have a, a support group that can follow uh, certain guiding principles of, of listening to others and providing affirmation and providing feedback and, and giving people a place where they can just acknowledge their challenges. I'll tell you about research of, of a, a Caribbean-based, uh, Professor Ezra Griffith, uh, was a psychiatrist. He recently retired from Yale University. He hailed from the island of Barbados. And he did research in the United States studying uh, Wednesday night prayer meetings at Baptist churches in New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale is located, and documented that all of the, the elements that exist in an encounter between a, a client and a formal therapist exist within the liturgy and the ritual of the Wednesday night prayer meeting service. There was an opportunity for people to express uh, their problems, for them to get feedback, for them to be affirmed, for them to get suggestions, you know. And he has a paper, it's published in a psychiatry journal, Ezra Griffith, you can look it up, of, of the where he says that the, these prayer services were an alternative form of therapy. So there are ways in which we can capitalize and, and create groups uh, uh, that are supportive of each other. It helps for them to have guidelines such as those that the World Health Organization provides where lay people can be a powerful source of support uh, to each other. Okay, thank you for that. Um, th there is another question. Has there been any studies initiated to, ac to access the mental health wellness and stress levels of secondary school children during the pandemic? Um, there aren't many. There are, I have not seen, and which, you know, there, there's so much, you know, I saw an article that said that, that since COVID-19 began, there are more than 500,000 scientific papers published on some aspect of COVID. So I, I, I have not read any that specifically focused on, on, on um, uh, uh, school children at the lower grade levels. However, uh, and one of the reasons for that is that um, in, in many parts of the world, and clearly in the U.S. where a lot of the research has been done, um, but also in other countries as well, uh, many of these schools were closed uh, for long periods of time. So there wasn't easy access uh, to, to students. But I think everything else we know, I, I'll tell you a stunning statistic. That, that troubles me enormously. And it, it, it shows the challenge faced uh, for, for black children in the United States. They have looked at national data on suicide rates of elementary school children in the United States. And they've tracked it from 1992 to 2016. And what they have found was during this period of time, this is children aged five through 11, Suicide rates remain stable in America overall. That stability overall masks the fact that suicide rates declined markedly for white children in elementary school. It stayed stable for Asian and Hispanic children in elementary school, but it doubled for black children in elementary school, both boys and girls. And for me, it raised the question, what does it mean to be 
growing up black in America right now with all the racism that you see on television and on social media? What, what does that do to the psyche of those kids? The, the study itself was just reviewing existing um, death certificate data, so it doesn't tell us what the reasons are. But that pattern, um, by, by the way, in the U.S., suicide rates have always been lower for 100 years for blacks than whites. This is the first study documenting higher rates of suicide for blacks, and it is among elementary school children. When I was in St. Lucia growing up in elementary school, I don't know that I knew what suicide was. And to think that there's this doubling over this recent period of time for black children is stunning. Um, so it does suggest, though, the bigger point, there, there are real problems among even very young children um, and that we really need to think, um, and many of the older generation, to that's my point about listening to them and validating them and, and affirming when they say they have these feelings, don't, don't dismiss it. Don't act as if it's unimportant. We really need to listen and support and find ways to engage with them. The single most powerful resilience factor for young children is having at least one adult in their life who they trust, who they think believes in them, and who they feel they can talk to and share whatever they have. And we need to build those relationships because that's key to the mental health of young children. Yes, that's incredible statistic there, yeah. Professor Williams. We have yeah. to close, but I have one last question I would like to ask you. It relates to help-seeking behavior and the stigma and discrimination associated with, with mental health. Um, yes. What do you, yes, what, what do we, you suggest we, can we, be done? We yeah. know that help-seeking behavior for mental health stigma. Um, there's a colleague of mine at the University of Indiana did a study of 40 countries around the world. In every country, there's a stigma. So there is a stigma on mental health. What I was troubled by the data I shared of West Indians in the United States, it, it seems to be an even bigger problem yeah. for, for, that, for that population. And so I, I think, I, you know, I haven't seen data within the region itself, but um, I, I, it's, it's concerning. And we need to think of where we can normalize, just as you go to a doctor, um, if you have a, a diabetes and if you have high blood pressure, heart disease, mental health is a genuine health problem and we should get treatment and there should be no stigma attached to going and get the help we need so that we can live life to its fullest. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to join you today. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Williams, again. And of course, your presentation was excellent. And of course, for the Q&A session as well. So ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our opening ceremony. We have an exciting program ahead over the next two days, and we look forward to your participation. To all speakers from this morning's opening ceremony, on behalf of the conference partners, allow me to extend our appreciation for your contributions. We look forward to seeing you interact and engage with other delegates over the course of the next two days. Session one of the conference is about to begin. On the platform that you are now, please click Leave Session and join us in the next session block on the Agenda tab. Thank you very much.